many, and this is an important question, how many of you drew this short straw in the last event planning meeting and have never been a volunteer coordinator before, biting your fingernails in anticipation of your first assignment? I knew there'd be one. Yeah, how many of you have fun as a volunteer manager? It's very good. You know, that's actually supposed to be fun, and I'm here to help it be both fun and effective. So the question is, what if I could promise you that you could cut the time it takes to perform your most repetitive volunteer management task by 90%. <laughs> what if I could show you how to redirect the time saved doing repetitive tasks toward the tools and systems that will raise the overall quality and effectiveness of your volunteer program? Because that's certainly my intention this morning. And also, what if I could show you how to make volunteer management fun instead of a chore? Some of you may have heard this uh, next quote, I believe I first heard it from Al Gore, and it is to travel a great distance, it's best to travel together as a group, but to get to a destination quickly, it's best to go alone. With the global and local challenges we now face, we must learn to travel a great distance quickly as one species and rally around a common sustainable purpose. And volunteer management for me is an amazing opportunity to experience exactly that. It's an exercise in social um, artistry and social entrepreneurship. Um, you're mobilizing potentially hundreds of people toward this unified vision. And to me, it also represents an alternative currency that supports an economy not of consumption, but of caring and sharing. That would solve a lot of the world's ills, I believe. For my first eight years in volunteer management, this was the tool that I used, it was an Excel spreadsheet. And it's, uh, I still use it, just not in the same way that I did uh, uh, preliminarily. It's kind of the beginning and the end of my, my particular methodology. The beginning is creating a matrix, so you really identify every single volunteer activity, um, and then you can use the columns to identify basically the who, what, where, when, why. You know, who the supervisor is, what days, what the hours are, um, I will be um, presenting the concept of an internal rating system. Um, this is a non-judgmental thing. It's just kind of a practical way of uh, making sure that you match a volunteer's skills, motivation, interests with this particular activity. And of course, this is a relationship development um, endeavor. So uh, you'll get to know your volunteers, and I'll give you some um, some techniques for really getting to know your volunteers better, their skills and interests. Under recruitment, we're going to take a giant leap beyond last year's tried and true recruitment model and leverage social media. And I know that's a hot button right now for a lot of organizations, brings up some issues, and I'm going to help you move on, move and, and utilize this amazing um, networked resource that we have. And this is an extremely helpful quick assessment. Motivated, unmotivated, skilled, unskilled. And clearly, the quadrant that doesn't necessarily help you is the unmotivated, unskilled. On the other end, you can have the extremes and overly motivated and overly skilled, the know it all, you know, the, the been there, done that, and doesn't really care to, to pay attention to new procedures, new policies, and things like that because they know it, you know. And that can be as challenging as the, as the other extreme. In terms of representing your organization, I like to use a real estate agent analogy. You're basically representing the buyer and the seller. And this is really an important thing. And sometimes it's a kind of a, a razor's edge to walk. Internally, to your organization, you're representing the interests of the volunteers. I mean, the volunteers are, well, they're people. They have feelings. They have um, a lot of things that are under the surface that you don't know about. But ultimately, you act as somewhat of a buffer to the organization, making sure that they can, well, it's a trust building endeavor, essentially. And when you're um, representing the needs and interests of your volunteers, your, your host organization, to your executive director, to the staff, in the development of your communications hierarchy, creating a feedback system, because these volunteers are also the front lines in many cases to your patrons, to your potential donors, to um, lots of potential resources and um, how your engagement with them has a, a huge potential impact on uh, the effectiveness of your overall uh, programs. 
externally, you're, as a marketing thing, you're now representing your, your organization to the volunteers, those potential donors, those potential even future employees. It's important to differentiate your services and the organization. Not so much in a competitive thing, which I'll talk about later. It's more we're in a spirit of collaboration at this point. You're creating a, a gratitude program that includes uh, perks, benefits, access to services, something that shows your gratitude. Of course, the organizational cultures, they vary quite a bit. And the attitudes toward volunteers and even the volunteer coordinators may vary from organization to organization. I'm saying that your ultimate goal is essentially a wind of the third power. And that's a balance between the host organization, getting what it needs, the patrons that you serve, and the volunteers themselves. And that's uh, been the goal of, uh, of Art of Volunteer Management. Um, and ultimately why uh, my company is called The Art of uh, Volunteering is um, after eight years of uh, managing this rather uh, monstrous event, we call the monster in a box. So, and uh, when that box is open in uh, early May, I just run as fast as I can through uh, Father's Day and then crash for about two weeks. It has been my training ground and why I feel qualified to share what I've learned with you <laughs> uh, here today. However, that's quite different than being a day-to-day -day volunteer manager and dealing with the, uh, the, it's a different cycle altogether. It's a very intense thing. Um, so it requires a lot more pre-production, pre-preparation so that when, um, the doors open or whatever, that the wheels don't fall off the wagon, but they will. And so it's more about if you're well prepared, adapting and knowing exactly where the uh, tire iron and the, uh, and the jack is. Some of you may represent an organization where the volunteer policies maybe feel a little stale or restrictive, maybe even primitive. And you may feel you need, you need permission to own your volunteer program. And if you need that permission, I grant it to you now. Own your program. And this is a posturing, essentially. When you present your ideas to your team leaders, um, your inspired determination will elicit some buy-in from them, um, and you'll have a lot more support. And what if your organization's management viewed volunteer programs as the front lines of capital development, of leveraged capacity building, of um, engaging future donors? You think you might get a bit more support and respect Cooperation, maybe. So what if your host organization really looked at your, your volunteer program as an adjunct to your whole marketing program? You, you probably get better t-shirts too. Because again, you've got all these billboards walking around. And this has always been a struggle, you know? Because uh, especially in the, this economy, you know, cheaper, 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 lesser quality materials, smaller print, whatever it is, you just simply are diminishing your all the billboards that walk around representing your organization. So it's kind of backwards thinking. But. So the potential impact of a thoughtfully designed volunteer program can have for an organization, what it can have for an organization is, is often really overlooked when in fact the volunteer manager or coordinator is the, the face you put in front of your potential donors. And if the volunteer experiences clear and effective communications, you have a clear sense of the when, where, why, what, who, how, they have a sense of inclusion. In other words, their frontline opinions matter. They're somehow noted. They, they can see the effect of their experience going back to the organization. If you, they feel really that their time has been honored when they've arrived on their, you know, to fulfill their task or activity. Um, and the, the gratitude and acknowledgement is really sincere. Then the volunteer is experiencing the support you receive from your host organization and uh, it not only supports retention of uh, the volunteer services, but again, it potentially leads to a new board member, a new donor, even an endowment that can support your organization for years to come. So what do we mean by uh, structure? It's uh, preparing your host organization or the team with an understanding of what the volunteer program will bring to the organization, along with, for your colleagues, um, how to best communicate the volunteer's needs, for your volunteers, the protocol, protocols of conduct uh, inherent within your organization. And then again, for your colleagues, the, the policies for interacting with your volunteers. Um, and this is really kind of a, a very critical thing. And I know some um, mature nonprofit organizations really do train all the staff on how to best work with volunteers, understand their, they have their own agenda. 
Roles can include sales, you're a planner, you're a trainer, you're a counselor, you're a supervisor, you're an energizer, you're the interface, you're a tactician, as well as a strategist, that's it. And you need to be able to walk through any given volunteer activity as if you were the volunteer and completely anticipate their experience. From any point of view within your organization, event, whatever, your patron, your volunteer, your staff, how things look, how they smell, what it sounds like. Here's an example, you're sitting in a restaurant and you hear the music in the kitchen and you hear the music out front. This cacophony is, doesn't set itself up for a, an enjoyable experience. And ultimately, when you tie the, all the, the, the four ma uh, major senses together, you're gonna have a feeling sense. It just feels good to be there. And taste is even a, a factor. How can you incorporate taste in anything? Well, snacks, obviously, you know, water. We, have, we all have needs that particular way. So this is a, a five senses approach to not only volunteer management, but also to helping anybody that utilizes your services really have a higher level of experience. There are many nonprofit organizations in our community that provide essential services, social services. And this creates a great deal of emphasis on how you market yourself, how you differentiate yourself from those other organizations. However, the paradox is with competition, we are in a, in a time and space where collaboration has to also be very much a part of that. So we have branding in the middle of that, but um, I wanted to kind of point out the kind of the paradox of the competition and the collaboration, because they're really antonyms, you know, from one sense. However, we do have finite resources in one sense, and uh, we need to really respect everyone's services. And the clearer you get about how you're, you differentiate yourself and how clearly you brand yourself as a specialist in this particular area as a complement to those other organizations that do similar types of functions. We're all enriched by that. And I think that creates a, an, uh, an environment of cooperation for the whole community. Make sure it's part of the conversation. And besides that, it's a, it's a small community and anything uh, that you say in a derogatory fashion about another organization just is gonna come right around back to you anyway. So um, by continuing to strive for your best, uh, clarifying your brand, differentiating your services, um, and being in competition, in a, in a playful and healthy manner, everyone continues to up their game. Using the metaphor of the, of the internet, um, in 1997, I was vice president of a, a dot-com startup in the Seattle area uh, called Netstock Direct. I went on to become sharebuilder.com. Uh, and we were uh, participating in the National Association Investors Corporation show in Cleveland, Ohio. And I was responsible for creating the, our presence there, our, our booth, if you will. And the metaphor of the internet is, this is uh, at that time, you know, this is just as e-commerce is coming into play, was you draw traffic, you gather participants based on the free information that you have. Now we happen to be an information clearinghouse about direct stock purchase plans. So I, we happened to be about two minutes from Microsoft campus and we had a good relationship with them. And they had a, uh, an outdated version of Microsoft Money boxes and boxes of it. Well, we didn't actually perceive boxes of it. It was, um, we thought there would just simply be a disk in a, in a, a little one-page thing. It would take them a lot of space. So they offered to give us like 2,000 copies of uh, Microsoft Money 19 whatever. And then suddenly, seven pallets show up in Cleveland. And we had a mountain of these boxes of software. And we had traffic. We had more traffic in that space than any other of the other presenters. Uh, and most of these other presenters uh, that had booths were part of the shareholder services departments of these companies who were trying to create a direct relationship with their stockholders. This is a strategy for uh, retaining this, this churning of money in that world. So a lesson learned. People like free stuff. And the internet has made it uh, very much a sense of, of, uh, of giving, of sharing information, and uh, for other services, you know, once you've established that and you have a loyal customer, then you can leverage that for other particular uses. You're gonna lose um, a certain percentage of your volunteers if you create a communications requirement that all of your messages go out by text messaging. You know, it's just gonna lose 
the World War II people, maybe the phase one baby boomers, and vice versa. If you require that all of your volunteers drive into town and sign a notebook or some kind of a schedule book, um, your younger volunteers, your incoming mass of volunteer energy, you're going to lose them. So you have to segment and clarify who are your volunteers. And it, might, it may represent a broad spectrum of, uh, of ages and, and demographics. So you're going to have to plan your communications um, strategy accordingly. But if you miss one, you're going to miss that particular group, or at least a good percentage of them. And of course, the internet is becoming very ubiquitous as a means of communicating. So there's really just not much um, excuse for not having that as a, as a primary part of your communications strategy. So what are the tasks that take up most of your time? Is it maintaining accurate contact information? Assessing your volunteer skills and motivation? Is it the scheduling um, and rescheduling, the last minute cancellations? Is it the training and orienting? Is it the supervising aspect of it? Or is it the retention, appreciation, acknowledgement on the, on the tail end of it? And what do you lose if you have your volunteers update their own contact information and schedule themselves? What do you lose? You lose control? Or is this an opportunity to get you to know your volunteers better? And what can you do to regain the perceived loss? Using an online registration and scheduling system that allows you to rate your volunteers, which contextually changes which volunteers, uh, which volunteer activities are actually able to be seen is, um, is an option. You can also get to know your volunteers through uh, social media, um, Facebook as an example. For the first eight years of managing the, the Maui Film Festival volunteers, I was calling everyone and just filling in information on a spreadsheet. I really, it was a great opportunity to get to know them. So when I was at the switchover point of going to an online registration scheduling system, I had to really look at what I was losing there. What will I lose if I'm not spending 15 to 20 minutes on average as um, answering lots of questions and customizing each individual volunteer's position for that week-long event. An effective volunteer manager is um, really just taking the time to develop these, these relationships. And the phone was, was a wonderful way. And also, each year, I got a sense of where the community was at. You know, people uh, losing jobs or having to move, or I, I got a, a feel of the pulse of the community, especially when the economy changed. So how do I compensate for that? I, if they're self-registering and self-scheduling, there's got to be another way to get to know them. This is where social media has kind of come in at the, in the nick of time. So of the volunteer management task here, which one would you characterize as the most in need of upgrade within your own volunteer program?